Repair It should be common practice to fix our stuff when it breaks, right? So why has it become so difficult to repair our items? And why are we losing repair skills that we practiced for generations? With funny shaped screws, irreplaceable parts, a lack of user guidance and prohibitive costs, more often than not it is much easier to replace than to fix. But as we tackle climate action and shift towards a circular economy, we must lower this threshold and make repair easier, cheaper and more accessible. Let's explore the future role of repair and how it will change for individuals, designers and producers as we move towards Ireland's circular economy. Good afternoon and welcome to this Circular Economy Conversation on the Right to Repair. My name is Sarah Miller and I'm the Chief Executive here at the Rediscovery Centre, which is the National Centre for the Circular Economy in Ireland. Our work here is very much focused on repair and through our social enterprise activity, public engagement, research and policy programmes, we seek to embed repair in the transition to the circular economy. Personally, I'm delighted to share this, to chair the conversation, which is delivered in partnership with the EPA and with the support of their strategic partnership. To kick off this event, I'm going to ask Sharon Finnegan from the EPA to join us. Sharon is the director at the EPA's Office of Environmental Sustainability. She has a broad range of senior management experience and policy expertise working across central government, where she has most recently focused on environmental policy and climate change. She has worked as the head of the Climate Change Climate Action Unit in the Department of the Taoiseach. And prior to this, she was the secretary to the Citizens Assembly from 2016 to 2018. And she has held a number of roles, including head of protocol and head of economic policy. So over to you, Sharon, to introduce the session. Thanks, Sarah. I'm delighted as EPA's Director of Environmental Sustainability sustainability to introduce this conversations on a circular economy webinar focusing on the right to repair. The EPA plays a central role in delivering circular economy in Ireland. We're currently developing a new national circular economy program to be a driving force for Ireland's move to a circular economy by businesses, householders and the public sector. In a circular economy, waste is prevented, product life is extended and the maximum value is extracted from products when they're in use. Repair is therefore central to a circular economy. Repair is a practical action that every citizen in Ireland can undertake, whether that's getting your phone or your lawnmower repaired, your shoes rehealed, or your clothes altered. Repair needs to be the default option before considering buying new. Supporting repair is central to EU circular economy policy with measures to increase and promote repair underway. Through the EU Green Deal Sustainable Products Initiative, we will see changes in policy and legislation that will bring obligations on manufacturers to make their products more repairable and initiatives to make repairing easier for citizens. Citizens will have a right to repair with spare parts and repair manuals readily available and the potential for repairability ratings on products. One of the ways the EPA works to deliver a circular economy is through strategic partnerships with national level influential organizations such as the Rediscovery Centre. This series on the circular economy conversations and indeed activities throughout June focused on repair are showcasing the potential for repair to new audiences and are made possible through our partnerships with the Rediscovery Centre. Community Resources Network Ireland is an umbrella organisation for community reuse and repair organisations in Ireland. Through the EPA support for CRNI, a network of furniture, bicycle and textile repairers are supported to deliver for circular economy in Ireland. Another way the EPA works to deliver for a circular economy is through providing support funding to innovators. The EPA funded Monaghan County Council to develop and manage repairmystuff.ie, an online repair directory for Ireland. This web resource provides a national platform for repairers to register for free and allows citizens to find repairers in their local area. This is a fantastic circular economy tool and the EPA will continue to work with Monaghan County Council to promote and develop this as a national resource to support repair activity. Through Green Enterprise, our annual Circular Economy Innovative Funding Hall, the EPA is supporting repair-related products, projects, including a project with Common Women's Network, which is delivering training and skills for textile repair 
on a project with on metal rubber to remanufacture bicycles. These projects are delivering skills and jobs for the circular economy. Moving to the circular economy is critical for Ireland, not only in terms of protecting the environment, but also protecting our prosperity and protecting local jobs. Supporting repair and repair activities can deliver for circular economy and the green transi transition in Ireland. I look forward to hearing from our different speakers today on their perspectives on repair, and I'll now pass back to Sarah to lead the conversation. Thank you, Sharon. So let's get started with this conversation. Um, I'm delighted to have with us today Oshin Smith, Minister of State with Responsibility for Communications and Circular Economy. And Oshin was elected a Green Party Councillor to Dunleary Rathdyne County Council in 2014. In his previous careers, he has worked with St Vincent's Hospital, and I believe he has also volunteered as a mentor at Coder Dojo, which I think maybe might bring some good technical skills to this conversation. Oshin Smith was elected TD for, TD for Dunleary in 2020. He's Minister for State, for Public Procurement and E-Government, and more recently has been appointed, as I mentioned, Minister of State with responsibility for the circular economy and communications. Minister, congratulations on your appointment. Hey, Come thanks, Sarah. Lovely to have you here with us today. Great. Yeah, then thank you very much for asking me along. And that was great to hear from Sharon there. Great. Can we take it now that your recent appointment is an indication of a serious commitment to the circular economy from the government? Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a total change of mindset. So we never had a circular economy department in the government before. We had a waste department. And that was about, you know, getting products that you, were used and then disposing of them in a field or, or else burning them and putting them in the atmosphere. And that was that was really the approach was a linear economy where you start by taking things out of the ground, put them in a factory to make things and then you get jobs. And then when you're bored of them or they're a little bit broken, throw them away. So we're changing to a new economy. So it's a massive change to say that's not what prosperity about. Prosperity is about keeping your resources and holding on to things, keeping them in a circular way and that when something is is a bit worn out or when it's something's not working that you fix it that we learn skills that we keep you know one of the problems with making new things every time something was worn out was that they ended up being made somewhere on the other side of the world so it wasn't making jobs and repairing things and keeping things uh is is going to make us more prosperous it, ha it leads to better community and um it gives us skills so I i'm really looking forward to visiting your center next week uh, and seeing in person rather than on a computer but how everything works and meeting people. So um, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you so much. We're also joined today on the call by Mark Miodovnik. Mark is Professor of Materials and Society at University College London. He has a PhD from Oxford University. He has worked as a materials engineer in the USA, Ireland and the UK. And for more than 20 years, he has championed material science research that links to the arts, humanities, medicine and society. Mark has recently set up the Plastic Waste Innovation Hub to carry out research into solving the environmental catastrophe of plastic waste. He is also a multi-award winning author of Stuff Matters. He regularly presents BBC TV and radio programmes, including the Dare to Repair podcast. Mark, it's delighted to have, delighted you, here. To have you here with us today. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you, there's a little bit of an echo, so hopefully we can address that. Um, maybe if I could just ask you, in your show, Dare to Repair, you really take a deep dive into the world of repair. Where did this fascination start? Well, I mean, it's just my own frustration, actually, you know, with with things coming into my life, I've got small kids and they would, you know, uh, these toys would come in, they're very, very sophisticated, very engaging, and they would last about a month before something would go wrong. Then I would be tasked by my kids to repair them. <laughs> and then I, it's just like a pulling your hair out and, and the disappointment of the small people. And then, and then you know, then you start looking at your phone and you realize, hold on a minute, the manufacturers have, they've made the battery unreplaceable. What, what? And, and so the world has, 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 has moved in my lifetime towards the expectation that you can repair the things that come into your home or someone can repair them, at least a professional, to mm. one where often they're non, not repairable or you're faced with the, that moment, you know, when you've got the repair person coming around for the washing machine and they say, oh, no, it's cheaper to buy a new one. And you're like, 
Oh, how did we, how did this happen? So the oh. frustration of myself, and that, I thought that was mirrored by society, oh. was what got me into this topic. Yeah, well, it's definitely a frustration I share myself. So I'm really interested to hear how you think we can address that. Um, next, joining us on the call, we have Christian Volkman. Christian is the Climate Crisis Coordinator and Assistant Manager at Patagonia in Dublin. And the company prides itself on making their clothes responsible and for life. He is a keen environmental activist and a multi-instrumentalist, and he's got a passion for planet Earth. So Christian, you're very welcome to join us here today. Uh, hello, thank you, and thanks for having me on. Um, it's for me really exciting, like you know, to talk about uh, repair stuff on online. Like, so um, what can I do for you? So tell us, um, does repair play a part? Obviously, it plays a part in your passion for the environment. Um, how big is that part, really? Well, I the first kind of came across repair when um, <clears throat> my grandfather taught me how to repair my bicycle when I was. Uh, five or six years old, and uh, it was um, it just led me on a journey. Um, and ever since, I, I feel very similar to Mark, like the frustration of uh, having small, like I have a three year old daughter now, so um, the frustration of fixing toys for her, or so and it's and she expects me now to fix things for her, she just looks at me whenever she breaks anything. <laughs> so, I, I, I'm kind of wondering, do I actually incentivize her to break things just so she can see me fix them at this point? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing more from you and from hearing about the work of Patagonia. Finally, I'm going to ask Niall O'Connor to join us. Niall is the Administrator, Administrative Officer with Environmental Services in Monaghan County Council. For 20 years, he has worked in waste management and he has developed areas of expertise in waste reduction, reuse and repair. Niall developed and launched Repair My Stuff, a national online repair directory with the assistance of from the Environmental Prote Protection Agency's Local Authority Waste Prevention Network, and that was launched in 2018. So we are very welcome, Niall. Good to see you here. Thanks, Sarah. Delighted to be here. So maybe you could just start by telling us what inspired you to set up Repair My Stuff. Yeah, as I said, I've been involved in waste management a long time. And as the minister says, I've seen this kind of development of, of waste gone from, you know, encouraging people to recycle to the, to the circular economy. And in the last iteration of the regional waste management plans, there was a tiny little policy that said, uh, let's try to support the repair industry. So uh, I, I suppose with the help of the EPA and some other colleagues around the country and uh, a wee network that we have called the Local Authority Prevention Network, uh, we together developed uh, the online repair directory for the repair industry to try to really support that uh, sector in yeah. a small little way, I guess. Uh, and it's developed since then and, and continues to develop over time. And, and now three years later, you know, it's, it's become uh, something a little bit bigger. Great. And something we're all delighted to see as well. Um, so, yeah, look, thank you all very much for joining us today. We're going to ask a few general questions just to get the conversation started. So I'm going to direct those to you, depending on where I think your interest might lie. And then we're going to open it up to the floor as well so that the audience can ask some questions. So I might just start, Mark, with yourself and ask the question, where did we, you know, how did we get to this place where products don't last and where repair is really not a viable option in many cases? Um, well, I mean, I think I think the answer is that we, we got wealthy. Um, and so, in you know, 100 years ago, people had very few possessions in their homes, except for the well, you know, except for the very wealthy. And we've all essentially capitalism has all has delivered material wealth. Uh, to the point where we had radios and TVs coming into our houses, sofas, beds, lights, um, phones. And as that material wealth got greater, um, it started to saturate. And, and, and companies in the end found that, that they couldn't make money out of giving us more uh, mm. without those things sort of becoming disposable in some way. So marketing comes along as a tool of capitalism to sort of get you to want more things. And that and also uh, they become cheaper and more convenient and then they you know that cuts the cost of production but it also cuts margins and they become disposable items essentially we've, we've ended up as a disposable culture and we've all accepted it weirdly 
Um, and I think now it, the, the penny has dropped only because of the environmental damage that's causing. I think I think if there was no environmental damage causing, I don't think people would be actually flagging most people, except for those on this call. We care because we have emotional attachments and, and we feel frustrated. But but I think most people, it's the ease of use, it's the convenient, it's cheap. You know, lets them get on with their lives. They feel happy throwing things away. <laughs> <laughs> and and just in terms to the. Um of right to repair campaign you know from a from a design perspective where are the main barriers there do you think yeah i mean so i'd I, to, 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 the, the 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 manufacturers are delivering much more complex products if you think of, an, of a children's toy you know it's got flashing lights it's got sound it's got a chip it's got a battery all in a tiny bit of thing above and you know it's got different plastics maybe 10 or different plastics in it and 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 it has to it has to you know, it's only going to be bought if it's less than five pounds. So, and it's got to be made in the million in order to make money out of that. So, no one has, no, none of these companies have the um, are going to design that for a pair. They want it to be a disposable item because it's so cheap, uh, and they're not going to design it to be repaired. And they don't. And so, it, all the stuff's hidden, all the stuff's glued together, all the stuff's. It's, it's just not. You know, that that's the way we've gone. I, th I think. I think the more subtle thing is for the stuff like. Um, washing machines and, and dishwashers and phones where software is now becoming a bigger and bigger part of the functioning of that and at some point even if you hang on to them the software gets out of date and the question for the manufacturers is who pays to update and 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 support the older models and and, and the thing is essentially the price you bought sort of only pays you for five years update and then they basically abandon you roughly five to seven years and I think I think that's another design problem, really, which because mm. we we've got to we've got to we've got to hit that. Uh, and then the, the other one is competition. Essentially, these, it's a fiercely competitive market out there. That's why, of course, we've got we've all got wealthy in terms of what our material stuff around us. But at the same time, that competition um, has meant that they're basically trying to get you to constantly buy new stuff, not repair old stuff. And and so the business model would have to change for design. It's not that it's impossible to design for repair. We know it's totally possible. Been, been done for centuries it's just we haven't the, 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 there isn't the incentives at the moment in there to do it okay. and lastly innovation if you talk to these companies a lot of them say if we design for repair we sort of we, we, we basically stagnate our product it goes on the market we have to keep supporting that product with parts that fit that product and we stop innovating because we can't then move the design forward and, and I think it's a valid it's a valid issue. I think people want constant new features. They want they want to feel fresh and new, the newness, addicted to newness. And I think it isn't it isn't easy for the designers of those companies to do something about that. Great. Thanks, Mars. I was I was fascinated actually by your discussion of obsolescence on your podcast and, and this idea of psychological obsolescence where people just need to have a new thing. I think it's a really interesting you know, concept and maybe something we need to look at a little bit closer when we're developing our campaigns to encourage people mm. to repair more. Um, I'm going to bring Christian in at this point. Christian, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the about main barriers to repair from a producer perspective, if you could. Um, coming from Patagonia, that question really puzzles me. <laughs> uh, we, we, like, you know, repair okay. has been built into our business uh, since the 70s, since we started. Um, and I, um, I kind of really had to think hard about that, uh, what to say to it. Like you know, the um, the fact is that um, uh, it like other than logistical problems for big companies to kind of implement a repair program and uh, the design process. Of course, you know, as Mark was saying, it's getting more and more complicated. So um, we design stuff to get less and less complicated since the 70s. We've always been trying to take away things from our products um, and, and to make them easier, repairable. Um, so I think from my perspective, I would have to say the main barriers is probably just, um, at the bottom line. You got to, um, you know, if you have to maximize your profits at all costs and the environmental costs don't feature into that, um, that's what you end up with. Yeah. Absolutely, something we struggle with here as well. Niall, um, just maybe to ask, how, how do you see the barriers in terms of maybe from a societal pr perspective? Um, is there anything you want to tell us maybe that you've learned from Repair My Stuff? Yeah, um, I, I guess as people said, people want new things. And uh, 
with innovation comes waste. You know, I remember when we moved to the uh, the um, smart TVs and, and you go out to a recycling centre any day of the week and you'll see a whole pile of TVs still sitting there because people want to upgrade and they want new things. Um, and then I suppose uh, as a society, wide point of view, you know, uh, where are these skills in our community? Uh, probably in, certainly in an older generation, many guys that are going around fixing washing machines are probably in their 50s or 60s. Um, so the repair services aren't necessarily as widespread as they should be. Um, and that is definitely a difficulty for people. You know, I, I get contacts all the time. Is there such a person in Wexford? Is there a person in Donegal? Is there a person there? And a lot of the cases, it isn't. Um, so we have to try to um, spread that, that repair industry out across the country to, and, and, and to have it in the local community. And maybe there's ways to do that from policy, uh, whether that would be, you know, uh, social enterprises and the like, to get these skills out there and make it much more um, uh, acceptable and a way to do for people to, um, you know, get re things repaired much easier. And have you noticed a shift in attitude um, in relation to repair? Um, people are contacting you more, looking, you know, to find, find out where they can get yeah. things repaired. But have you noticed a shift? Uh, like yeah, it's definitely gotten busier over the last while, and and it's and it's funny, you know, uh, things that people want repaired goes in cycles. Uh, you know, uh, last March, April, I must have had fifty emails uh, over the space about six weeks. Want people want to know where they could get a treadmill repaired uh, because uh, it had been sitting in the house for as, as a clothes horse for you know, four years, and suddenly we're in lockdown. And everybody wants a treadmill. Uh, and, and then, you know, um, at Christmas time uh, or, or just after Christmas time, we have the hair straightener. Uh, uh, so where people get hair straightener, the hair straighteners and, and then they, they break on them. So, you know, there's kind of cyclical things. Um, obviously, bikes have gotten really popular as well in the last while. Uh, and, and people wanting bikes and, and being able to access a bike. And of course, bikes is one of the things like, you know, I bought a secondhand bike there for, for recently. Um, and you know it didn't attract the um, the bike to work incentive and yeah. small little things like this I think can make from a society perspective make uh, repair and reuse much more acceptable. Absolutely, that's a, we can identify with that. It's something we've certainly been pushing for in policy for a long time. Is that that um, inclusion of second hand within the bike to work scheme? I think would be a great great initiative. Um, and again, with the um, the need for bicycles, we have we have been inundated here with requests for our secondhand bikes, and also actually for our, our paint as well. So for our recycled paint, we've been out the door with you know orders for paint. So I think it was everybody during lockdown, you know, deciding yeah. that they were sick of their house and they wanted to have a, a complete remake. And, and thankfully, we were able to support some of that. I'm going to um, ask you to join us again, uh, Minister. You've heard about some of the barriers, I suppose, from a design perspective and from a producer perspective um, and also from a societal perspective. It'd be really interesting to hear where you think the barriers lie with respect to policy and from a governmental perspective. How can, you know, where are these barriers that are stopping repair being more prevalent? I think, yeah, so I, th I, think, our, I think our economy is set up with a bias towards um, buying new and producing and you know when when you need something that you you that you replace it with with a new object rather than fix it mm -hmm. and i think that to to change that you have, you know you you need to make sure that it's not more expensive to fix something than it is to um to buy new and you have to look at things like the the tax rates that are levied on people who are repairing things versus people who are importing and selling things so that i mean that's that's one approach but also you find you need you need to have the skills available mm -hmm. and you need to have parts available and those things can't be sort of magicked up suddenly they're about how your whole society is is laid out how your economy is is arranged and your economy is arranged according to how people expect things to work and uh you know how your education system works um how the taxation system works um and how your supply lines work so you know for example with a bicycle your bicycle you, you, you need to get a new bike or you sorry your bike has, has got a problem and you, you're thinking well I'd like to get a new bike, um, and you know, is what what happens if you go for the repair option? Are the parts available? Is there somebody with the skills to do it? Are there qualifications for people who are bike mechanics? You know, do do you know is is it um, is it 
is it feasible? Is, would you trust going on a bicycle that had been fixed by somebody or is there a quality um, problem? So all of those things can be changed by the government looking at things like education, uh, taxation, and just the setup of the, of the entire economy. So that's, they're, they're, I think they're, they're aspects that need to be looked at. And I take that, I, I, I've never considered the fact of the bike to work scheme. Bike to work scheme has a lot of flaws you know, the way that it is, it, it, um, for example, that it favors people on higher incomes rather than lower incomes and that yes. you, you can't get money back off it if, unless you're in work. Uh, so, for example, if you're retired or a student. But I hadn't thought of the fact that it only applies to brand new objects. And that's that's absolutely something that has, has to be looked at because the work that, that's involved in the circular economy tends to be local, tends to be within the country. And the work in manufacture tends to be outside the country. It's as simple as that. Yeah, great. I can see lots of questions coming in on YouTube, so we're going to get to those soon. Don't, don't worry. Um, Minister, you, you touched on a few of the, the the opportunities there. Are there any, in addition to potentially bringing the bike to work into uh, the second hand bikes into the bike to work scheme? Are there any other opportunities that you've identified, maybe through the circular economy strategy or other policies that you're hoping to implement now on the back of the climate action bill? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a circular circular economy action plan, which is a big, long list of things to do. And you should have a look at it. And it's been yeah. through public consultation. But I mean, for example, we're, we're funding a network of cycle repair hubs, community cycle repair hubs throughout the country. And the idea is that you can apply to set up one in your town. And it creates, I guess, similar to the center that, you, that you're running, Sarah, in that it, it trains people, it takes people in, even if you have no qualifications whatsoever, even if you've got a murky background, you can come in and they will train you up. And at the same time, you're providing a service, a local service to the public. You're, you're providing them with, with cheap repaired goods. And at the same time, it's a, it's, a, it's a community activity and it's something that draws people in, in together. So that's an example of something that, that, um, that we're doing. And we have, a, we have a long, long, long list of things like that. You know, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, that sounds really exciting, actually. Mm -hmm. We'd be keen to find out more work. Can we find out more of, about that particular initiative? Obviously, we work very closely with a number of reuse organizations and hubs through the Community Resources Network. Is there somewhere people can go where they can be supported to maybe? Yeah, believe it or not, I think that's that being run by the Department of Rural and Community Development, or uh, um, I may not have exactly been the right name for it, but that, that's, the, uh, that's the department that's running that particular scheme. But you'll find there are schemes like this throughout government. It's not just going to centre in my circular economy unit. Uh, it's throughout. And I had a meeting with the Taoiseach and the Taunach recently to discuss, to go through all the circular economy plans. And there was genuine enthusiasm from them. And it's also it's now accepted at a European level that this is the direction of travel. This is how you get, uh, this is how you get emissions down locally. This is how you um, reduce... Uh, and this is how you get local employment, you know, it's how you get skills up and in, a, in a practical sense, because not, not every skill should be about things you learn in, in, in books and academic learning. Like a lot of stuff is hands on and a lot of people are happier doing things with a, with a physical element to them rather than looking at a computer all day. Absolutely. Great. Niall, could I ask you to come in maybe, um, have you identified any opportunities maybe through Repair My Stuff where we could encourage more repair or support repair more? Yeah, um, like I, I, I've worked with the two, like, you know, repair, I think repair can be divided in two items, electrical repair and everything else. And I guess there's, there's you know, two compliance schemes in the country and we've dealt, uh, started working with them over the last 12 to 18 months with the White Goods Association and, and the two uh, compliance schemes, We Ireland and EURP. And I suppose it's to bring in the manufacturers there because a lot of them would have uh, a network of authorised repair um services and mm -hmm. it's really to try to get that idea that you know there's authorized repair available to people uh, i think we talked a bit about the barriers and, and the quality and the insurance and i guess if you knew that uh your guy or your girl had been trained by Beco or Dyson or one of these and was authorized to repair that product, it might make it much more acceptable. So that's the opportunity I'm working on presently is trying to get a network of authorized repairers up on the website to make it easier for people and have more confidence in the repair service that is being provided. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, Mark, maybe if I could ask you to come in from the design perspective, where, where do you see the opportunities then? And how can we incentivize maybe and influence that? I, I think you need to. I think companies need to to, to think about the future, and I think that's difficult because they're often trying to look two to three years ahead to just to make, just to keep making money. It's very competitive out there. But the truth is that we 
we're going to have to have washing machines, phones that last 10, 20, 30 years if we're going to get to net zero. And so the whole economy has to transition to the repairable paradigm. It's going to have to do it. Uh, so um, the opportunity, I think, is for the early adopters in the in the manufacturing world to really work out what that business model is. How do you make money out of something? I just want to give the example of a washing machine because everyone essentially has one in their house and you kind of need one and you need one for your whole of your life. So it's not it's not an option as I see it. It's a kind of necessity. So at the moment you buy one and it lasts four or five years if, and then if something goes wrong with it, essentially it's, it's not surprising. It's a very useful thing. It's constantly running at high speed. It's got lots of complexity. And then essentially someone comes in to have a look at it. It's a motor, it's a bearing, it's, it's a software thing. And often they'll say to you, cheaper to buy a new one, right? Because look at it. I mean, you can buy one for 200 or 300 euro. It's unbelievably cheap. <laughs> and that is a miracle it's so cheap. But the, the reason it's so cheap, of course, is we're offsetting, we're offsetting all the emissions and we're essentially not paying for them. Yeah. But now let's think of, of the same thing. Now, I want a washing machine for 50 years in my life. I, perhaps I, want it to, I don't want it to have to keep buying a new one. So what's, how, do I, how does a washing machine manufacturer make money out of that situation? Selling me one that's going to last 50 years is going to be a one-off purchase, and then that's it. And the, and the repairs probably aren't going to fund it. So I think we have to really rethink the service model for these kinds of goods. So they sell you something, but they, they're actually selling you a service and that service will continue throughout your lifetime so instead of instead of you not hearing from whichever company is Bech, Bo, Beko, Bosch whatever, you actually hear from them every year and if you if the washing machine goes down like in our house if it goes down that's like an emergency like if, it, if the washing machine is down for two or three days <laughs> the washing piles up you know the schools complain the mud you know if, if, if I was a washing machine company I'd be looking towards okay you, you give us a call and we're around there. We'll, we'll be around there in 24 hours and we guarantee you'll be washing again. And, and, and essentially you pay an essentially an insurance, which is where the most of the money is coming from. And that and also because you've got a relationship with us, we're also going to widen the goods that we sell you for your home. So we might get into toasters and we might get into dishwashers and we might get into other things. So actually, we're managing a lot of the goods in your home that you think of essential. And you're, we're so trustworthy. We know that if you pick up the phone, we're there that you want to pay the money, which otherwise you're paying just as these one off purchases. Yeah. I, I think that's the way it's got to go um, for these things. The other thing that these companies need to, I think, get their heads around is that supply chains are going to get stretched. We've seen this in the pandemic and holding on to commodities is going to be the name of the game. They're going to go up a lot as oil prices reflect the fact that we're going to wean ourselves off oil. Things like copper, steel, aluminium, they're all going to go up. Mm -hmm. and. As a company that, that deals in millions of tons of this stuff, and this is the electronics area I'm talking about, you, you're, you're better off keeping hold of that stuff. So they're not selling you the machine. Essentially, they're keeping hold of all the parts. Every time they replace something, they, hold, they take that back. They locally, and this is where local jobs come into it, locally you get local um, redesign uh, or remanufacturing of those parts. And so you have local supply chains, more stable. You're holding on to the materials less risk so I, I feel like these are the opportunities yeah absolutely we were, we were talking about pair per use this morning actually in, directly in relation to washing machines here at the center and I, I think there's a great opportunity there for this pay for service rather than you know paying for a product and then having to replace it and that just builds in so much opportunity for reuse and repair and indeed the whole labor market around that we're seeing lots of questions coming in I'm going to just quickly ask um christian you you know you spoke there about patagonia and the great work that they're doing in terms of the from a producer perspective where do you see opportunities for other producers um and other retailers really for repair um well our our customers want that stuff to happen mm -hmm. but, you know uh, I, i've seen i've been with patagonia since 2003 in 2008 uh, we were um, one of two businesses on Exchequer Street that made more money in, in the recession. And it was purely due to um, the old school hikers bringing in their their children and saying, buy a jacket of these guys because they'll fix it for you. You need it fixed. You know? And um, so um, the, um, as, as a business model, it makes complete sense to us. It, it, it is the best advertisement that we could ever have come up with. Um, and um, it, even more importantly now, if you're really serious about that kind of stuff, it also helps your carbon footprint. But you're bringing down your carbon footprint as well. And that's um, a, another major incentive coming in uh, with, with new regulations. Coming in. So that's, 
that's probably the easiest answer I can give you there. Brilliant, great. I'm, I'm just gonna switch over to the questions from the audience. Um, I'll, I'll direct these to whoever I think in the panel may be able to answer them, but please, if any of the other panel, panelists want to jump in, just, just let me know. Um, so I'm going to get started. And Niall, I think this one's for you. So it's a question from one of our audience, uh, Mary Connolly, who asks, how can we get involved and how can we support this initiative? Niall might be on mute there. Or Sorry, there. I uh, yeah, we've had a lot of community support, uh, support, um, from the likes of Tidy Towns that would have done this as part of the competition where they um, advertised in their community for repair services. So any business can register on on the site for free, and it's really you know trying to uh, promote the site uh, to mainly through social media challenge um, channels and, and Google AdWords. So really, it's a try to uh, encourage businesses to register and the more businesses that we have we've you know getting up on on, on 900 uh, mm -hmm. and the more places that we have it the better the service will be i guess it's frustrating if people go to the website and there's no um service in their area so we're really trying to get as many businesses up uh, as possible to be able to service the need and i suppose from that then we'll encourage people back so encourage business to to, to register and encourage people to use the site Great, super. And then I think in general, you know, Mary, if you're looking for information on repair and reuse, um, obviously check out our own website at Rediscovery Centre, but also check out the Community Resources Network, um, crni.ie. There's lots of great resources and support there. Obviously, we have a circular economy strategy or draft strategy now, which just the consultation closed for last Friday and a circular economy programme, which is delivered through the Environmental Protection Agency. And there's huge opportunity there for everyone to engage and to participate, I think, in the repair sector. Um, Minister Smith, or I think we might ask this one to you, and I know it's one that several of our members on Circular Economy Academy certainly would be interested to know. Are there any tax incentives or could there be tax incentives to encourage companies to repair? And that's from Sheila Guilford to encourage companies to repair things. Oh. Yeah. So I think, um, and I think you're, you're not talking about designing in uh, designing in repairability, oh. so making sure that the batteries can, can be replaced, that the, that the company itself um, would look. I, I'll tell you what, the tax strategy group is part of the Department of Finance that assesses all the plans, all the suggestions for taxes for the budget every year. And I'll bring that around to them. That's a that's a good suggestion, and I'll ask for that. And that, that they they meet around this time of the year, and then prepare a report that goes for the budget later on in the year. So what you're talking about is changing the tax rules for companies to make to incentivize them to fix things instead of replace them. I think that's a good absolutely, idea. and and maybe looking at tax incentives for repair companies as well. I know a lot of social enterprises involved in repair would be interested in that. So that's certainly something that might encourage new businesses maybe to start up start up. And, um, and to repair. I think as well, if there was an opportunity maybe through campaigns like the Right to Repair to ensure that companies um, make parts available, make manuals available so that people can repair, that that's probably something that's a really interesting um, carrot maybe, or, or maybe it's a stick, I'm not sure which one, which way you go with it, but I think we do need access to the manuals, we do need actual access to affordable spare parts as, as well potentially um another one then there is a concern that manufacturers may restrict the access to the spare parts so that kind of ties in with what i was talking about and that comes from the community resources network um how can we ensure that everybody does have the right to repair in ireland i know france has brought in some new legislation and indeed the uk to support right to repair and to introduce repairability indexes for products is that something we could look at minister within yeah i think so too i think i think we, you don't want to have restrictive rules on your product that says that you know once you unscrew it that you know that's it that your your guarantee is gone or that you've you've broken a licensed term and that you're not allowed to do that that you don't really fully ever own the product so you definitely want we definitely want to make sure that 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 and that I think that's something to do at a European level is that products are are designed to be repairable and that there aren't restrictive clauses which are sort of planned to to prevent the uh, average person from using them and also that that generic parts can be used as well you know that when you need to change the the light bulb 
that you don't have to buy a bulb that comes from the person who made the lampshade in the first place and you, you know that, that, it, that it is possible to have swap in parts that are that are made at least up to a certain standard but yeah definitely that's a legislative thing okay um i'm not sure who might know the answer to this question but do we know do beco have authorized repairers already mark is that something you know no i come in maybe i i'm pretty sure they do yeah um most of these companies do make money out of repair and, and i think but i think the professional repair community i think that's for for an economy to thrive i think it would be healthier to have a professional repair community because otherwise who who are doing the repairs because otherwise you're going to get restrictive practice and you're going to get increased inflation in prices yeah absolutely and that was another question was brought brought up by luca she was worried that maybe there would be a restriction and would stop people from having a go at fixing things. Um, and that maybe ties in a little bit to liability. We do have a couple of questions on liability. So one important challenge raised in the recent circular economy strategy was liability. Um, and this is potentially an issue for community repair cafes as well as professionals. And how can this be tackled? Um, I be happy to open that up to any of, of the panelists. Niall, perhaps you might have some thoughts on on how we could tackle the liability. Yeah, uh, yeah no, uh, like it comes up all the time. Uh, when I first started out on this, people thought it was crazy advertising repair services that uh, Monning County Council will get sued if the repair service got went uh, wrong, you know. Uh, like it, it definitely is an issue for people and uh, it, it probably needs to be uh, taken at, at, at government level and a policy level and it is it is the legal system that we have in this country it's, it's different in other countries uh, and it's definitely an issue uh, for people um, and, and for businesses to be able to um, guarantee their product I guess you know and uh, it, it is probably going to be have to be tackled at, at, at national level and a policy level yeah Anyone else like to come on on that issue about liability? Christian, your hand up. Um, well, for, for Patagonia, it, it's a bit like um, the relationship that we have with our customers is is a bit of a contract, right? We, we kind of tell our customers how to look after the stuff and that we'll repair it as long as it makes sense at all. And um, <clears throat> they, they kind of have that understanding of, um, you know, that responsibility that they have for their product and how much we can meet them towards the end when it does need to be repaired. So um, there is there is a lot of education that I guess you can do in general um, and manage expectations. But um, it's it's in a way it's a kind of social contract. Like you know, we will fix it as long as it makes sense at all. Okay, great. Sarah, is it is it a problem for your center? Can I ask? Like, is and for centers like yours, getting insurance and you know, um, is liability a problem? And can you explain it to me a bit better? Yeah, sure. So it, it's not a problem. You can get insurance for sure. Um, and th the problem lies maybe in the the, the, the wide range of, of charges that you may come across with the insurance companies. So um, we obviously are insured for all the delivery of all our services. We have never had a claim in the 15 years or so of operation. Nobody has ever, you know, fallen off the bicycle as a result of poor workmanship or anything like that we very much invest in our staff and in the training programs and making sure that the products are of extremely high quality um, insurance isn't an issue but certainly it can be cost prohibitive um, and that's something you know we've talked about is there a way of maybe having a collective insurance system for reuse organizations that might be something that could could warrant investigation but for us, no, we, you know, we operate like any other company. We have our insurance policies in place. We take on that liability and we have the, you know, the, the insurances there should anything touch where it never happens, but should anything occur? Um, I guess where the difficulty lies is where you potentially have a lot of volunteers working in a repair cafe and then there is no umbrella organization that holds the insurance. That's my understanding of the difficulties around repair cafes. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess uh, every bike, bike shop and every car mechanic must face that that issue because yeah. you know your life is at risk when you you take the repaired product and it happens every single day. You're you're going out and you know the, so that and it, they, they're they're facing that problem already, aren't they? They do, yeah. But I think we get hit twice, so I think sometimes it's not you know we're not seen as a regular repair service or a you know a. a 
a man of remanufacturing we are the companies look at us and they hear the word waste resources or you know rebuilding and then they get very nervous so we we kind of get yeah. hit from two sides you get hit as a waste operator even though we yeah. don't operate with waste and then you get hit from from the um, product side of things as well so that can be uh, difficult i suppose okay <laughs> um but yeah something surely that has been, that has been raised as an issue for many um going to jump to another question here from um, Evie, she wants to know, are there apprenticeships that train people to fix electric cars? So I'm, I'm not sure if anyone is aware of or can answer that question. The concern of the lifetime of one of these newer technologies puts people off buying electric cars and investing in them, I guess. So do we know what kind of infrastructure, what training programs are being developed or designed to support new technologies? Anyone? No, I think we, we'll have to come back to that one, Evie, but thank, thank you very much for your question. Um, is there any sign of a repairability mark being introduced for appliances? This would definitely influence purchasing. purchasing. Um, that is from Max Lavelle. Yeah, I understand there is a repairability mark in, in other European countries, and I think the, I think the French have one. And, um, uh, product labeling is really important as a way of guaranteeing to the public that something is not just marketing lie you know <laughs> yeah. so, so i think i think that is a really good i think that that's a really good suggestion and i'll look into that okay and, and actually just following on from that claire mclaughlin had a question um it's been said that companies are trying to keep up with what people want and it isn't driven by market but isn't that driven by marketing and advertising so this is the whole dichotomy Who, who's actually pushing the market here? Is it the advertisers and the marketing people or is it the, the scientists, the engineers and the technologists? So we do we need stricter regulations around marketing? Should that be considered as well? Who wants to jump in on that one? I, I can talk. I can say a little bit about that. What I think I, I, I think I think we live in capital, capitalist economy and and marketing is part of that. That's the sort of deal. I, I, I feel you can't really legislate for that. You can legislate that you can't have um, you can't have claims for products that that are, that are misleading. But I think you know whatever you do is going to be very hard to do that. So I, I think it's about education. In in the chat, I can see there's a lot of people talking about education. I think this is where we have to go. Like we are going to get bombarded with adverts. That's what capitalism does. It also gives you all this wealth. So you, you know you have to take that with it. But I think we have to educate our kids to see through that stuff and. I think that starts at school and I'm really frustrated in the UK where I'm based and my, my kids are at primary school that they're not taught to repair stuff. It's, it's, it, it, it's, um, you know, it's such an easy way to interact with stuff and to, and to work how, how things work. So it's a way into science and engineering, but it's also a way into design and art. Um, it's a way into textiles. Um, and I think culture change and the appreciation of how amazing this stuff is that we have in our lives. <laughs> I think that's the way to defeat the marketing and the, and the advertising. I, I think I think legislating against it is just never going to happen in a capitalist country. Interesting. Anyone else want to comment on that? Well, there is um, there's definitely a call for um, the whole business model of of the straight line maximization of profits uh, kind of thing to be and somewhat made to benefit the planet uh, and there there are business that there is like certifications out like the b corp um certification mm -hmm. that Patagonia are part of um that um incentivize companies to actually look at um more than just the, the um, cash bottom line and that you know looking at stakeholders and community impact and environmental impact and waste impact and so on of, of your products um you know should be a legal requirement uh, so I think if you start talking about systematic change like that from from the top to down kind of approach, mm -hmm. but also as Mark was saying, um, just you know teach people not to believe everything they see on the TV or <laughs> you know everything that people tell them, like you know, um, and that's I mean certainly in the last couple of years um, uh, coming up as a as a major issue that really needs to be addressed. I guess. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully the. The legislation brought in under the sustainable products policy will have some impact on that um, and we can get rid of some of that greenwashing but it is indeed a, a serious issue i think because you see more and more advertising 
at the moment, green this, green that, good for the planet, biodegradable, compostable, and it's very difficult to actually get your head around what is a truly sustainable product. I think um, the triple bottom line accounting is something that certainly the social enterprises involved in the Community Resources Network have been doing for a long time and, and something that could be applied to the, the wider business sector to really let people see how businesses are run. Ideally, you know, there shouldn't be any such thing as corporate, so corporate social responsibility. We should be all running really good businesses. And I agree, B Corp is probably a good way to, to start to push that. Um, couple of we've got seven minutes left so I'll see if I can get to a couple of other questions we have lots and lots of questions coming in um, one here from Stephen O'Reilly how can we sidestep the over commercialization of the circular economy and how do we keep the role of social enterprises minister I might ask you to come in on yeah that. I, I think I think there's a role for both you know as we talked about earlier that we that we need to find a way that commercial companies are moving away from are, are getting into the circular economy as well that they are that they have incentives to repair things and that they're not designed and all set up for for always replacing replacing objects rather than fixing them but at the same time there's also a role for social enterprises in doing things that may not make immediate financial sense but contribute to a community or that or that add towards the stock of of skills and, and education in society so that so i think they're they're both those things have to happen at the same time I think it's a, it's a complete um, rewiring of society. And just to, to just to go back for a second to the idea about marketing, I think Stephen O'Reilly also asked this: is you know, can marketing be used to promote circular economy? And you know, you I think it can. And you said earlier that there's something nice about buying something new. You know, you have something shiny, brand new, that kind of phrase. But there's also something nice about um, accessorizing something. And there's something nice about personalizing something. And there's something nice about you know repairing something so that it's even better than it was and you have a sense of belonging or you know you have you've, you've more of a sense of ownership that you've put something into it yourself and and i think that those aesthetics can be promoted and those ideas and i think they do they, they can fit in and, and that i think that is something that 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 can change in people's people's minds is to say to people you know vintage clothes for example you know um or you know you see these jeans with rips in them and so on, and the, or the idea of something having a, a patina of age, or the or having a kind of a, a, a classic uh, look to it is is something that is also valuable, other than just being brand new, shiny, and different from version seven or whatever the hell you know the the iPhone aesthetic that it's you know it's 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 new, it's shiny, it's different, it's got a new number. That let, what about having something that's classic and timeless? Yeah. Great. Um, and listen, there's there's so many questions coming in. I think we're, we're going to have to start to wrap up. I know we've already taken up most um, people's lunch breaks and we really appreciate you all joining us here today. I'm just going to give the last word over to our panelists. So um, maybe if you could just wrap up by telling us what are the main action points that we should take away from today's conversation and how do you feel personally we can support repair into the future? And maybe I'll start with you, Niall, if you would you would like to um, give us your thoughts on that. What's the main takeaways for us today? Yeah, uh, I think there's been lots of uh, interesting points raised. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the kind of hardware issue. And we haven't really delved into this whole kind of software issue that, that Mark alluded to. And I think that's going to be the mm -hmm. next massive challenge for us. Uh, I have a perfectly, perfectly good iPad at home that I can't use because, uh, the, as the minister says, it's iOS 0.3 or something like this, but a, a beautifully engineered product uh, yes. for its time and still a beautiful product. And this whole idea of software, I think, is going to be the next big challenge for us. And we just alluded to it briefly. And maybe the next time we come back, we can talk about that a little bit more in depth. Absolutely. Thank you. And thank you very much, Niall. And um, Christian, could I ask you to maybe give us your thoughts on what we should take away from today? Um, I would say it's easily um, recognizable that, like through our market research and so on, that that really the younger generations are so interested in this kind of thinking and that um, old school product or you know things that have a pattern of age uh, that are um, you know are, are kind of sexy that way. Like it's it's uh, it's a uh, it's just a um, uh, marketing is absolutely useful for this kind of stuff. For Patagonia, 90% of our marketing is environmentally based. And uh, so the whole Warnware uh, program that we run um, is um, 
uh, is set to grow. So I think to companies um, uh, that are not into repairing yet, like you know, it's uh, show that flexibility and and yeah. kind of think away from your business model into new into new places. People want to spend money on experiences now. They don't necessarily want to spend money on things anymore. So services to keep those experiences going uh, that's going to be a major thing. Thank you so much, Christian. Mark, can I put the same question to you and ask for your main takeaways for us? Yeah, I mean, I I, I, I feel like um, one of the things that we really need to do is get repair into school. I think education, I really do think, we, we're talking about a massive cultural change. The minister's just saying it. it's a complete shift in the way mm -hmm. that we run our economies. And it's a non-optional, like net zero is coming and it's the only way that we're going to keep the, the earth cool for humans and for other creatures. And we can't, we, we're just going to have to repair everything. Everything's going to have to be designed for repair. And our kids are going to take, need to really get that at school. We, I think so education, both in schools, but also talk to your own kids and your own nephews and nieces and talk to the people outside the school gate and tell them how you're repairing stuff. Tell them how you're buying this thing. It costs a bit more, but now it's repairable. Um, I, I talk, you know, tell them about websites you, that you found that you uh, take you through how to change a battery on your phone so that you're not upgrading your phone because you can't change the battery. You actually are changing the battery, which actually turns out to be quite easier. I've done it a few times now. And so I feel like let's all do let's all make this cultural shift happen by talking to each other, talking to our schools and and do, and live that life ourselves. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. And Minister Smith, if I can ask you for your main takeaways and what we should consider for repair. Yeah, so, so I, got, I, got a, I got a lot of stuff out of this. Thanks very much. Looking forward to seeing you next week. The, um, one of them was that to make sure that our incentives towards behavioural changes, things like the Bike to Work scheme, are not focused solely on new goods. And that would apply, for example, first time buyer grant. Can't, why can't you get that to renovate a house instead of why is it always to be buy a new house? Mm -hmm. um, a liability scheme for uh, repair uh, cafes and, and you know places like that. How do you, how do you how do you make sure that there's something for um, social enterprises that they can't get sued so easily? A repairability mark must look into that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so to tell people that something is fixable. Um, that a new aesthetic that uh, that people would say that they rather than buy new that they would love to you know a marketing campaign I suppose to support that. And then finally, how do we stop software from being um, a tool used for obsolescence or or or, or that getting in the way of fixing stuff how do we how do we deal with software that attaches to goods that didn't need software in the past like washing machines and so on so how do we how do we get it get around that so those are food for thought great ideas thank you. thank you so much i think you're going to make a lot of people happy with with those action points um and i suppose it is just gone past two o'clock so i would like to thank all of our panelists who joined us here today minister oshin smith td thank you very much thank you to mark mia dovnik thank you to niall o'connor Thank you to Christian Volkman and thank you all for attending here today. We'd also like to thank the Environmental Protection Agency for supporting this event and for participating in the event and for the ongoing support of our strategic partnership. We will continue with these circular economy conversations and we will back, be back again with you shortly with another in the series. Again, thank you all for joining. Thank you to all the panelists and we will see you all again soon. Hey, thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.